Now let's talk about burns. When we talk about burns, sometimes when you get a lecture about burns, it's very fragmented. Why? Because there are different types of burns. So we're going to categorize this into different types of burns. So the first thing we're going to talk about, the first type of burn we're going to talk about is topical burns, meaning you pour an acid over you or you pour a base, something like Drano, you know how you clean your, your pipes with and things like that. Th those are topical burns. Now, very simply, very simply, all topical burns are treated by irrigation, irrigation, irrigation. Years ago, we used to treat topical burns by trying to neutralize the agent. In other words, if you got a topical burn of Drano, we would put vinegar on it. Vinegar is an acid, acetic acid, and vice versa. We don't do that anymore. You irrigate, irrigate, irrigate. So that's very, very important to know. What you do is you irrigate. All right, that's topical burns. All right, so now let's go to electrical burns. Now, electrical burns are very, very similar to crush injuries because the electricity goes through and fries the muscle, just like, ju just like you have in a crush injury. Same type of thing, with one exception. With an electrical burn, you always got to worry about what? The heart, always. So in your brain, an electrical burn you first must rule out a cardiac injury, how troponins, EKG. But then you think of it in the same way you think of a crush injury. And what are the three things released by a crush injury? Acid, potassium, myoglobin. How do you treat it? Hydration, diuretics, and alkalinize the urine. And, and I have seen people who have been hit by lightning and they survive. And I've seen people who have gotten significant electric shocks and they survive. And, and the main reason they survive is you gotta watch their heart, make sure they don't develop uh, arrhythmia. And you gotta treat their crush injury type of chemical abnormalities. All right, next. So we talked about topical. We talked about electrical. Now we talk about inhalational burns. Inhalational burns. Generally speaking, you cannot burn thermally your trachea bronchial tree. You cannot, generally speaking. Now, if you work in a factory that has superheated steam, which I've never seen in my entire 38 career, uh, year career, yes, theoretically, but for all practical purposes, you cannot thermally get a tracheobronchial pulmonary thermal burn. Those burns are chemical burns. They are chemical burns. And the two types of chemical burns we're talking about are carbon monoxide and plastics. Boy, plastics will destroy you for, with a chemical luminitis. So understand, yes, we talk about singeing of your eyebrows and eyelashes and, and a soot around here. All that tells you is that you have an inhalational 
process going on, a burn. But I want you to understand that that burn is a chemical burn, not a thermal burn. And how do you treat one of those chemical burns is carbon monoxide. How would you treat that? You certainly would treat that with 100% O2. And if it was a chemical burn from plastics, you'd need supportive care, steroids, antibiotics, and that's really dangerous. Now, don't forget, if you have an inhalational burn, you have to immediately secure an airway. Why do I say that? Because if you, the patient may look fine, breathing fine, the airway's fine, no strider, and you wait a few hours and their airway and face will be so swollen, it'll be closed up and you'll have to do a cricothyroidotomy and then a tracheostomy. So don't forget about that. There, you have to be safe. You have to stay out of trouble. So those are inhalational burns. So we've talked about topical, electrical, inhalational, and now we get to skin and soft tissue burns, which is the main kind of burn that you always think about. So I'm gonna ask a real simple question. Which do you think is more severe? A scald burn from hot coffee or a flame burn from a match or a Bunsen burner? The answer is a scald burn. Why? Because, listen carefully, the severity of a burn is directly proportional to the length of time the insult is on you. That's so important, I'm gonna say it again. The severity of a burn is directly proportional to the length of time that the insult is on you, meaning if you have a flame burn, if you have a flame burn, you could immediately move your hand or whatever away. But if you have hot coffee on you or whatever, you can't get that off of you fast enough. Even though it's just a millisecond more, it makes that big a difference. Oh, the worst burns that I see in my practice are scald burns. Oh, without question. And they usually occur when the winter time and the power goes out and the patients boil water for their bath and they're carrying their water upstairs to their bathtub and it spills on them. And if you've ever seen a movie like Braveheart, and movies like that where when uh, people would go towards the castle walls and they would pour hot oil over them. The reason that that worked was because you couldn't get off the oil fast enough and it really was a very, very severe burn. And uh, again, I, I don't like to bring this up, um, but I, I will just teach you because you're doctors. When we would use flame throwers in wars, um, it's not just a flame that comes out, it's actually a liquid. So the liquid sticks on the person. And so that's, it's just a scald burn, an unbelievable scald burn. And again, I, I just want you to understand that. So that's scald burn. So now when we talk about skin and soft tissue burns. We talk about local effects and systemic effects. Local effects and systemic effects. So let's first talk about local effects of a burn. 
a first degree burn is to find physically it looks like a sunburn histologically epidermis pain yes capacity for regeneration 100 percent second degree burn what does it look like blisters histologically dermis pain yes but it's not as bad as first degree because some of the nerve endings are destroyed capacity for regeneration 100 percent third degree burns what's it look like charred white histologically full thickness full thickness pain nope no pain. Nerves are done. Capacity for regeneration is zero. You need grafts. You need skin grafts. So that's the local aspect of burns. Now let's talk about a few of those. If you have severe second and third degree burns, and those burns are circumferential around your arm, your leg, or your chest. Something happens within hours that you just can't believe, and that is called eschar formation, E-S-C-H-A-R, meaning in deep second degree and third degree burns, the soft tissue turns into leather, and I mean leather. Meaning, if it is around your chest, the nurse will call you up and then say, the patient is hypoxic, they can't expand their chest. They'll, they'll call it's around the arm and they'll say, there's no pulses. And guys, you can't tear eschar. Meaning, when I first saw eschar, you know, I thought I could you know, tear it. I thought I could rip it. You have to use a scalpel. You don't need any anesthesia because all the tissue is dead. But the thing I want to impress upon you is you won't believe what it looks like. It looks like leather. It feels like leather. And it happens hours, within hours of a deep second or third degree burn. So the point is that every time you have a circumferential burn, arms, legs, or chest, you have to worry about eschar. And when you cut that eschar, what we do is we call it escherotomies, escherotomies. And you don't need any anesthesia for that because it is already dead tissue. All right. If you happen to see on a baby, buttock burns, you know that that is most likely child abuse. Why? Because you can't sit and get into a bathtub by themselves. So I just want you to understand that if you ever see that, that's very significant for abuse. So that's the local aspect of burns. So now let's talk about the systemic complications of burns. The early complication of burns is hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock. Because you get a tremendous amount of fluid that leaves your vascular system because of increased permeability. And if you've ever seen a burn patient, the next day 
you will not be able to recognize them. They look like, what is that, the Stay Puff guy, Marshmallow Man, the Michelin Man? They are so swollen, you won't be able to recognize them. So the early complication of burns is hypovolemic shock. So you have to give fluids. Well, how do you figure out how much fluids to give? You use what's called the Parkland formula. And the Parkland formula is four cc per kilogram per percent burn in 24 hours. Let me repeat that. The Parkland formula is four cc's per kilogram per percent burn in 24 hours. So how do we determine, how do we determine what percent burn? We use the rule of nines, the rule of nines. My whole arm is nine. My whole other arm is nine. My whole leg is 18. My whole other leg is 18. My entire trunk, front and back, is 36. Guys, they don't care whether you have a 40% burn or a 42% burn. They care whether you have a 40% burn or a 70% burn. So again, the rule of nines. So let's do an example. Let's do an example. Let's say you have a 70 kilogram guy, has a 70% burn. How much fluid will they need in one day? Let's multiply four times 70 times 70. That comes out to 19,600 cc's, almost 20 liters. Guys, you're talking about almost a liter, an IV that's a liter an hour. Now, you young people, I could give you a liter an hour and your heart would, you, you would tolerate it, but boy, your heart would not like it. You get someone with comorbidities or heart problems or things like that, and they will die. They will clearly die of congestive heart failure. That's why severe burns are so dangerous. And as you know, you're all thinking to yourself right now, you have to give half. You have to give half of that amount in the first eight hours. So how do you determine, test question, how do you determine the adequacy of resuscitation by urine output? Guys, you don't give the patient a urinal, you put in a Foley catheter. You determine the adequacy of resuscitation by urine output. So hypovolemic shock is the early complication of burns. What is the late complication of burns? Gram negative sepsis. It could be E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, gram negative sepsis. All right, so the early complication of burns systemically, hypovolemic shock, late complication of burns, gram-negative sepsis. Now, listen carefully. You got a bad burn, and you're hydrating the patient by the Parkland formula, got your Foley catheter in, and about two or three days later, the nurse calls you up and says, doctor, the urine output has increased tremendously. It's like 200, 300 an hour. Is that normal? Yes. Yes, it's remobilization of all that swelling that's remobilizing back into the vascular system. So that's normal. That is normal. 
I want you to understand that. It's normal. So again, the most common type of burns we deal with are the skin and soft tissue. You recognize the local aspects of the burns and the systemic aspects of the burns. And remember that if you have a third degree burn, you need grafting. And one final point when we talk about burns, one final point. We used to allow burns to demarcate. What we meant, we, we sat on the burns uh, that we knew we were gonna have to graft. We let them demarcate, see exactly what we uh, needed to graft. We'd wait, you know, a week or something like that. No, 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 we don't do that anymore. Early excision and grafting. Early excision and grafting. Guys, when we have a, a burn that we know is third degree, we excise it and we graft it earlier because it actually improves things tremendously. So always remember early um, excision and grafting. All right.